sorry. Hey, John, um, throw something at me next time, okay? If you need a Bible, raise your hand, and then we can provide a Bible for you, okay? Wonderful. Steve needs one. Okay, so this is James the Just, and uh, this is the half-brother, the half-biological brother of Jesus. He's the son of Joseph and Mary, and as we talked about last week, um, he did not believe in Jesus when Jesus was in his ministry. And we see that in um, the Gospel of John chapter 5, I believe. Uh, after Jesus died and rose again, he appeared to James, and that's when James believed. Um, and uh, we know that from, I believe it's 1 Corinthians. So James, sometime around Acts chapter 12, Acts, through Acts chapter 15, James had risen up in the church and became the pastor, for a better word, of the church in Jerusalem. And the disciples, Peter, uh, began to focus on uh, missionary work at that time. Up until that point, Peter was kind of uh, the uh, de facto leader of the church. But about Acts chapter 12, we start seeing James step up. And by 15, he is very prominent. He's kind of the leader of the church. So James is writing this book, and he's writing it to Jewish Christians. We know that from verse uh, 1, chapter 1. And uh, the uh, kind of main focus of James's book is uh, how we as believers should be living, the outward actions uh, of believers. And uh, I remember I read that quote from a commentary. It, the book is um, about uh, an outward-serving faith driven by an inward saving faith. That's James's focus here. So um, last week in chapter 3, James talked a lot about the tongue and, and how we should speak. And uh, he, he tells us that, that uh, humans cannot, con cannot tame their tongue. They cannot control effectively. Sure, we can go a day or two, but we're always going to trip up and say things that we should not say. And we looked very closely at this, and we went to what Jesus said about how it wasn't what went into a man that defiled him, but what came out of man, because in his heart is the root of that sin that drives that tongue. And until, you, uh, until Christ changes your heart, you're never going to control your mouth or your actions. And so um, uh, James continues, he, in, 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 cha in the beginning of chapter 4, he starts talking about pride and how Everyone's fighting with each other because of what's going on in their hearts. And then um, he talks about, in verse, chapter 4, verse 7, he talks about humility and how that is what is the cure to this pride that's causing fighting between believers and each other. Is we have to be humble in our hearts. And here in verse um, 11 is where we're going to start. And it says, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? So um, he says, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of brother judges his brother. So, you know, this is obviously the heart. What's going on in your heart? Where does this come from? We talked about gossip last week and how this, um, how gossip is to, to relish in the failings of another person and enjoy someone else. So that is, that's not love for that person in your heart when you talk evil about somebody. Um, let's flip over to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus speaks about this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. And uh, we're going to be in Matthew a few times, so if you want to just leave your finger in the book, we'll be bouncing around in it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. Let me get there. Okay, this is Jesus speaking. He's talking about uh, the heart. And he says here in verse 21, and Jesus says, you, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever, commit, whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. So Jesus says, 
the law says don't commit murder, and if you do, you will be judged. But I tell you, if you're angry in your heart with your brother, and this is interesting, without cause, you shall be in the danger of judgment. So this, this phrase, without cause, um, it actually is a play into what murder is. Murder is to kill someone without cause, to unjustly kill someone. And so Jesus uh, takes this and ratchets it, ratchets it up. And he says, no, I tell you that if you're angry without cause in your heart, now you didn't actually kill them, but when the Lord looks at your heart and sees that, you're in, you can fall under judgment. It's as if you did. And the reason why is because when you murder somebody, it starts here. To kill someone without cause, it started first in, with hatred in your heart. First. And so that is where the root of it was. And we talked about this, the, uh, of all the things start here. And then he continues on and he says, Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in the danger of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in the dangers of hellfire. So the word Raka means worthless. And so um, it's calling someone worthless. You're worthless. And um, evidently, if at this time, if you called someone Raka, uh, they could haul you into court. Now, to call someone worthless is de to dehumanize them. You're taking away their humanity in your eyes. Um, but Jesus says here, but whoever says you fool shall be in the dangers of the fire of hell. Now, when you call someone a fool or an idiot or anything else, you're not necessarily saying that they have no value as a human being. You're just saying that they have less value than you. Jesus says, if you even say that, you will be in danger of the fire of hell. Why is that? It's because you have no love in your heart. When you call someone that, a fool, you fool, there's no love in your heart for that person. And uh, we know if there's no love in your heart for your fellow man, then there's no love in your heart for God. Let's flip over to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. Verse 20. First John 4, 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love God his brother also. So if you say, well, I love God, but then you treat your fellow man without love, well, you are an absolute liar. You can't have one without the other. So let's uh, flip back into Matthew, if you still have your fingers in it, and this time go to uh, chapter 22, Matthew 22. And we are in verse uh, 34 through 39. Twenty-two, thirty-four through 39. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now this Pharisee asked him what was the greatest commandment, but Jesus gave him the greatest and the second greatest, didn't he? And the reason why is because you cannot have one without the other. They're both there. They they're both belong. If you say what John said, if you say you love God but hate your brother, you are a liar. And that is what Jesus is saying here. He says you are to love the Lord your God with everything that you are, and you are to love your fellow man as yourself. You can't have one without the other. And then back here in James, we're in verse 11, he says, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. 
So James says, if you speak evil of your brother and you have hate in your heart towards him and judge him, you are actually speaking evil of God's law and you are placing yourself over God's law. You are no longer, and the reason why is because you and your brother are both under that law and if you are condemning him, you're saying that you're better and you're taking the place of God's seat of judgment. You're taking God's place by judging him. The Lord judges him, not you. Now, I want to say something here. A lot of people who are living in sin love this verse. They say, oh, you can't judge me. You're, you know, Or s people who don't want to confront others about sin say this, well, I'm not the judge of anyone. To give themselves a pass. That's not what the scripture is saying. There's a huge difference. Being judgmental of someone is to have um, evil in your heart when thinking about them. But to look at someone and look at what's going on in their life and then in love going to them and trying to convince them to repent, that's all about love in your heart. Why, why would you do something like that? Who wants to go and have a hard conversation with someone? It, no one does. But we do it because we care about their future. That's a loving act. And we said last week, telling the truth to someone is loving. Lying to someone is not love. Lying to someone because you, you don't want to have the hard conversation with them is not love. Okay. That's evil. Because you're basically saying, I don't care what happens to you. My comfort matters more to me. And uh, James says, if you judge, so if you have that, that evil in your heart and you, you look at down on somebody, you are actually putting yourself in God's place. You're judgmental on them. Uh, and he says that you're, you're trying to put yourself over God's law. Let's flip back, it, speaking of the law, let's flip back to it. It's in Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, verse uh, 13. Leviticus 19, verse 13. So this is the Lord speaking. In verse 1 it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the congregation of the Israelites, and then he starts giving them um, what they should do. And this section is, is talking about how they should treat each other. How we should treat our brothers and sisters. How we should treat other people. And in verse 13, in Levit Leviticus 19, it says, you shall, not treat, you shall not cheat your neighbor, nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. So... The reason why God is giving this command is because the hired man counts on those wages to feed his family. So if you withhold that, that puts him and his family in financial distress. So the, what the Lord is saying is, is you shall think about other people. You, sh you shall consider uh, what will happen to them if you don't fulfill your part of the bargain. And you, sh you should do what uh, you're supposed to do, what you agreed to do, which is pay this man. Now, that doesn't mean, nowadays, most of us get paid every two weeks or every once a month. Uh, that's, not, that's not wrong. Because what the Lord is saying is, is that don't withhold wages from somebody. They, they'll cause problems for them. You know, they can't make their rent. They can't buy food. Uh, nowadays, because of our banking system, it just is, makes way more sense to cash one check every two weeks instead of a check every single night. You and I wouldn't want to do that. So, but... That's something we agree to when we get hired. We know we're going to get paid every two weeks, so it's fine. It's not breaking this. Uh, and in verse 14, it says, You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God. I am the Lord. So to curse someone behind their back who can't hear you or to, to trip a blind person, it's cruelty. It's cruelty. Cruelty. You're, you have no compassion for that person who is less fortunate than you. And, you, uh, and you're doing this to them, and, you, and it says, you shall fear your God, I am the Lord, meaning you shall remember that I'm watching, and if I see you do that, you're in trouble, right? And in verse 15, he says, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, meaning that if you're called into jury duty, 
and a poor person is suing a rich person, you don't give the poor person what they don't deserve simply because they're poor and you feel bad for them. And the, and, uh, the other side is true as well. You don't let a rich person or person who has political connections off the hook simply because they're rich and famous. You treat everyone the same. You, it says you shall do no injustice in judgment. Kind of like um, the lady who stands in front of our courts holding the scales. She has the blindfold over her eyes and says justice is blind, which probably isn't really true in our country anymore, but it used to be. And then God continues, he says, In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go uh, about as a talebearer among your people, or a gossip, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. That's God's way of putting an exclamation point at the end of it. And in verse 17, he says, You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Now, this is a really interesting verse because he says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, and then right, he turns right around and says, you shall rebuke him. And that's what we're talking about, to go to someone and, and uh, rebuke them of their sin. We read that in Luke 17 last week. Jesus commanded that too. He said, if, you're, if your brother offends you, you go to him and rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he does it seven times a day and comes to you seven times a day, you forgive him all seven times. And God says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall, and I will put in, you shall love him, so you should go to him and call him back to repentance. And then verse 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall, and here it is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That's the second commandment right there. And so James is talking about don't go around speaking evil of people which is a commandment, don't be a gossip. That's what it said in Leviticus. And don't hate your brother in your heart. And he says down here in 12, he says, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? It's almost like when we get judgmental, we're trying to sit in God's chair, and he comes up to us and says, get, get out of my chair. That's my throne of judgment, not yours. So we continue on verse 13 in James. It says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. So James is addressing human pride, where we think we can do it all, um, where we can, we, we take no account God in our, in our lives. We don't think about what the Lord wants for our lives. And we think, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that in my own strength. And we ignore the fact that things happen. Life throws curveballs. No plans, uh, what's the phrase? It says, uh, it says uh, uh, the best laid plans. Have you guys ever heard that? The best laid plans? I looked it up. Um, that's from a, a poem. This is kind of interesting. So what does the best laid plans mean when someone says that? They're saying, they usually have, they say it when something goes wrong. You're saying, well, we all plan for stuff, but things happen and messes our plans up. That, that phrase, that colloquialism, is from a poem from 1785. And what it was, was there was a Scottish farmer, and he was out plowing his field. And um, he, his plow went through a mouse's nest, a uh, field mouse's nest, and destroyed it and killed the mouse. And he started, he saw it, and he felt really bad about it. And so he went home and wrote the mouse a poem. And the name of the poem is To a Mouse. And the line that we get this colloquialism from reads uh, like this. It says, uh, the best laid schemes of mice and men go often askew and leaves nothing but grief and pain for promised joy. So, he was, went home feeling bad about what had happened and he, real, and he was thinking about how much work that poor mouse had put into digging his hole, completely oblivious to uh, this farmer who's about to gum and plow up his field. And so this term that we use, the best laid plans, comes from this poem and it's meaning we work hard and we make all these plans and we're completely oblivious to that truck that's coming or to the, that diagnosis from the doctor or all those things. And so that's what James is saying. He says, come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. And James says in verse 14, 
whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Now, it's not wrong to make plans. The point is, is what's going on in our heart. Do we have pride? Do we, you know, oh, I'm just going to pull myself up by my own bootstraps and I can do this. In verse 15, he says, Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now your boast is in arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good does not do it. To him it is a sin. So James has spent the last four chapters talking about how we should live our lives as believers. And now that we know, if we don't do it, James is saying, you're going to be sinning. You know, the Lord is in you. The, the Holy Spirit is coaching you on how you should live. When you do something sinful, you feel it. To not do it is to sin. You don't have an excuse. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last day. So James is not saying to be wealthy is, is inherently sinful. What he's talking about is the folks who put their hope in their in this world, the things of this world. And he's telling them that these things will fail you. Jesus talks about that, right? And what's interesting here in verse 3, he says, your gold and your silver have corroded. Has anyone seen gold, corrode, corroded gold? It's because it doesn't corrode. Right? Gold never corrodes. That's why um, archaeologists dig it up out of tombs, 3,000-year-old tombs, and it still looks like the day it was cast. Gold is, uh, and silver does corrode a very small amount, but just on the very outer layer. And once that happens, it protects the silver underneath and it doesn't go any further. You can polish it away and it'll be almost brand new looking. And so because gold and silver are very resistant to corrosion, uh, their scientists call them noble metals, noble metals. And so when uh, James says your gold and your silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you, What's that mean? It means they weren't really true treasures. They weren't true gold and true silver. Whoever sold this to this person ripped them off. Now, spiritually speaking, it means the things of this world aren't true treasures. They don't have true value. Let's flip over to Matthew chapter 6, verse uh, 19. Matthew 6, verse 19. You know this verse. It says, do not, this is Jesus speaking, he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where neither thieves, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The things of this world are temporary. We know that when the Lord comes back, it's all going to be done away with. But the things eternal, the true treasures, they, they last forever. They'll never go away and they'll never rust, they'll never rot. And so James here in chapter 5, he says... Woe to you, rich people who have put all your faith and trust in the things of this world. They will, they will fail you. They will fail you. And the fact that they will fail you will be a witness to you. That you the fact that they corrode and they're full of moth, moth holes, that's a witness that you put your trust in the wrong thing. And in verse 4 he says, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, so there's that Leviticus thing we talked about, remember? The law said, do not withhold. And here James is talking about, it. he says, the wages that you didn't pay the people that you were supposed to pay them for the work, they're crying out to the Lord of Sabbath. 
Now, this is not Sabbath. This is Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath is, you know, Saturday, the day rest. Sabbath is a kind of a King James thing. They didn't translate it, but it means um, hosts or armies or many. Some of your Bibles may say Lord Almighty. But what it's saying here is that these, uh, this, uh, what you've done to your laborers who you didn't pay, that is crying out to God of all. He's the judge between you and them. You're in that courtroom standing next to that man whom you failed to pay for the work he did for you. And hit the wages are crying out to the judge to get him justice. And then verse 5 says, You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. So the folks who are living for themselves, everything is about pleasure in this world, to get rich at any cost, and I don't care about other people. I have no love in my heart for other people. And I, all I want to do is have as much fun and be as wealthy as possible. These things are, uh, you're, all you're doing is fattening yourself up for the day of judgment. Fattening yourself up for the day of slaughter. And it says, you have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. This reminds me of the story of Naboth. You remember that story? First Kings chapter 21. So Ahab and Jezebel, they were the king and queen of northern Israel, the ten tribes of northern Israel. They were extremely wicked, especially Jezebel. She worshipped Baal. And uh, the guy that dealt with them, the prophet dealt with them, was Elijah. And they hated Elijah because he was always prophesying bad things about them because they were super evil. And uh, if you remember the story, Ahab, his palace, there was a field next to it. And it belonged to a, a good man named Naboth. And Ahab wanted to buy the field from Naboth and plant a vineyard so he could have a nice vineyard to enjoy himself in. And Ahab went to Naboth and offered him a pretty good price for the field, but Naboth refused because it wasn't right for him to sell his inherited land. Remember that the Jewish people had been given land as their inheritance and they weren't supposed to sell it away. They were supposed to pass it on to their children. So Naboth said no. And Ahab went home and do you remember what he did when he got home? <laughs> he, threw, yeah, he threw himself on his bed uh, pouting like a little child. And of course Jezebel comes in and says, what are you doing? And he says, well, this guy, you know, I, I wanted to buy this field and he wouldn't sell it to me. So Jezebel says, okay, well, let's get this field. And she hatches this really terrible plan, wicked. So what she do? She hired people to go into the city and say that Naboth had blasphemed God and the king. They got the whole city through a lie riled up against Naboth, they hauled him out and they stoned him to death. Then Ahab went and took the field. And so in uh, 1 Kings, uh, God sends Elijah and uh, Ahab is in his field enjoying his new vineyard and Elijah comes up to him and prophesies against him. And he tells Ahab that in the same place that the dogs licked the blood up from the ground, that was spilled during the stoning of Ahab, they will lick up his blood, the king's blood. And then Elijah prophesies against Jezebel and says that the dogs would eat her body and there would be nothing left. There would be no burial. So as time went on, the Lord uh, sent in uh, a, a king to, to try to take Ahab's throne. Ahab was killed in battle in his chariot and he bled out in the floor of his chariot and they lost the, the battle. So his charioteers rode the chariot back to the city and they washed out the floor of the chariot and onto the ground. And the dogs came and drank the, the puddles up. And it happened to be the exact same spot that Naboth had died. And then as far as Jezebel goes, when the conquering guy came in, he called up and her servants pushed her out of a window and she fell to the ground. And uh, they came back the next morning to bury her, and they didn't find, all they found were just little bits of her because the street dogs had eaten her. And so uh, in verse 6 here in James, it says, you have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. 
But he says, you have fattened yourselves up for the day of slaughter. So the, this, you who, who live for this world, you put all your trust in this world, and you'll do anything to get rich, even harm good people. Don't think that God doesn't see and don't think that you'll escape judgment. All you're doing is fattening yourselves up for, for the day of slaughter. And then in uh, verse 7, he says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it, re it, is, it receives the early and latter rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of, of the Lord is at hand. So James is he's re acknowledging something that, that I think we're all facing now, what is in all of our hearts now. We were just, as things get more and more evil in this world, I can't tell you how many times I pray, oh, Lord, please just come back. <laughs> I'm kind of done with all this. Let's, let's get the show on the road. I just want to go to heaven. And, but this is not a new thing. Even back then they were praying this. We just want to see Jesus' face. Let's flip over to Second uh, Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 and we'll be in verse 9. We'll go through 15. 2 Peter 3, 9. So Peter is discussing mockers who in the last days will uh, say, well, God made all these promises. I haven't seen them yet. And uh, Peter addresses this. He says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, the promise of his return. As some count slackness, but he is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So what he's saying is, is the reason why the Lord tarries so long, 2,000 years now, is not because he's going, is slack in doing what he said he was going to do. The reason why is because he's merciful. And he's giving everyone time to repent. He wants everyone who is to go to heaven to have that opportunity. So it's really his grace and mercy that he, that he tarries. But in verse 10 it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will burn up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So Peter is saying, you know that the Lord is coming back. And as believers, you should act in this world as if he's coming back. And that's what James was talking about, right? How do we conduct ourselves as followers of Christ? In verse 12, he says, Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Yeah. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him, by him, in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider the long sufferings of the Lord is salvation. Consider that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation. The Lord tarries because of his mercy, waiting for all to come to him. So James is encouraging the folks. He says, be patient, be long-suffering, persevere. And in verse 9, James chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen that the end is intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth with any, uh, excuse me, with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. So James says you should live your life in such a way that people know you're an honest person, that if you say yes, it is yes. And if you say no, it is no. In uh, men's group, I can't remember the, the reference to the psalm. <clears throat> I think it's 22. Um, David says, um, a righteous man keeps his word even when it hurts him. We talked about this in, on Monday night, excuse me. <clears throat> Meaning that a righteous man 
makes a promise and then later finds out that that's going to cost him. He keeps it anyways because he made a promise. He, he's trustworthy. <clears throat> I have a frog in my throat. Okay, I actually want to skip uh, down to verse 19, then we'll come back to verse 13 at the end. Because, so in verse 19 it says, Brethren, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So this is that rebuking part. And that's a very strong word. We read that, oh boy, that sounds very intense, almost mean, but that's not what it's saying. It's saying to, in love, go to a person and have the hard conversation with them because you care about their future. It's a loving act. You don't want to see them fall off that cliff. A uh, story on that. Tiffany and I graduated uh, high school together, and our high school senior year, we went on a senior trip, and we'd saved up for a long time as a class to do that. So we drove all the way down from uh, Oregon down to LA, and we were going to go to Six Flags and and uh, well, a Disney World, a uh, Disneyland, in that. So it's a 13-hour bus ride from Roseburg, Oregon, all the way down to Los Angeles, 55 miles an hour, big school bus. The uh, the bus driver stops and he says, "You know what? This is really boring. It's just a straight straight shot down, down the I-5." And uh, he says, "Why don't we take the 101 down?" Now the 101, it, some of you know, it's the road that follows the coastline all the way from Washington, all the way through Oregon, all the way to, to Oregon, and it's right on the edge. I mean, it's basically a cliff the entire time with the, the ocean right there. It's extremely windy. Of course, everyone's like, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. So we turned a 13-hour bus ride into a 26-hour bus ride. <laughs> so I don't know how far we got. Um, we got down in California, I think two in the morning, pitch black outside. And the van that was following us with all the luggage ran out of gas. And so they stopped at the only gas station for miles because there are sections of that road that are just deserted. There's nothing. The problem was is that that um, gas station didn't open up until six in the morning. So they call ahead and so we and the bus have to stop to wait for them for four or five hours uh, so they could get gas and then we can continue on. So, of course, we've been in this bus for, I don't know, 15 hours. And so all these teenagers pile out of this bus on the side of the road in the middle of the dark. And uh, it's 2 in the morning, so they are kids sleeping all over the sides of the road, you know. And I remember we, I'm standing there, and you see these headlights come up as someone's driving down the road, and they slow down, and there's all these dead bodies on the side <laughs> of the road. <laughs> and, they slow, and then finally someone kind of waved, and, you know, and then they kept going. So when the boys piled out of the rig, we're on the side of a cliff. We don't know it, though, because it's pitch black, and the, the teenage boys do what teenage boys do when you first get out of a car on the side of a cliff. So they're all lined up on this cliff doing what they do. <laughs> and uh, one of our good friends, John, he doesn't know that there is a 100- or 200-foot cliff with ocean and rocks straight down, pitch black, and he comes running and he steps right out into the void. Okay, he's going to die. And our other good friend reaches out and grabs him by the shirt and basically sucks him back into terra firma, sucks him right back. It saved his life. And I think the Lord was involved because John outweighed our friend. So it shouldn't have been possible for him to pull him back, but he did. And he's like, you're on a cliff. And, of course, everyone's like, whoa. Okay. So that's what I, the reason why I bring that story up is because of what he says here. If you... Reach out and grab your friend and pull them back. You save their soul. That's that idea that I have when I read this. And uh, we're getting close to closing here. We're a few minutes early, but that's okay, right? So, um, you know, this is a praying church. We always pray. We have people up front at the end of all the services to pray. It's really important. We pray uh, in men's group, we, uh, we do one-on-one -on -one prayer. The group breaks up into one person and one person. They pray together. The women's group pray together. Uh, every, every time, we're always praying for each other because we're close to each other. We're family. We care about each other. It's really, really important. So I want to say this for last because that's what James says here. He says in verse 13, 
Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced fruit. And uh, that had to do with Ahab and Jezebel when he did that. So as we come to a close a little early tonight, if you have prayer requests or something going on, uh, Pastor Scott and I will be up here. Tiffany will be up here. Um, come get prayed over. I thank you for coming tonight. And um, I believe that uh, Don and the crew in Israel are in L.A. right now. So they'll be home tonight. It is loaded up on the airplane in Los Angeles, so they'll be home tonight. So probably this Sunday we'll see them. Okay, let's close out. Lord God, I thank you for your blessings, Lord, and I thank you for this family, God, and how we just love each other and we encourage each other, Lord, uh, and because you're in us and your love is coming, pouring out of us, Lord, and how you've changed our hearts so that we can um, conquer this evil tongue and this sin in our lives, Lord, because you are doing it in us, Lord. I pray over uh, uh, everyone here that you would bless them and that they would uh, that we would all serve you and honor you with what we do and what we say. Lord, make us people th that the world looks at and knows that our yes is our yes and our no is our no. I thank you that uh, our brothers and sisters coming back from Israel have come home safe, and I pray that you bless them on this last leg of their journey. And Lord, I'm very confident that for several days they're going to be recuperating from all the travel. So just give them strength and rest, Lord. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.